the dense and rugged Alaskan wilderness provided the perfect cover for a fierce and sadistic killer. He preyed on women, kidnapping them, raping them, torturing them. He hunted them like animals for his own twisted pleasure. In the 1970s and 80s, people went to Alaska looking for a fresh start to reinvent themselves or to disappear for a while. Some of those disappearances weren't by choice. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. A serial killer's rampage was exposed when the bodies of young women began turning up in shallow graves that dotted the Alaskan wilderness. The killer was at home in the rugged terrain, but the hunt for him began 3,000 miles away where FBI profilers mapped the criminal's mind. She was a hopeful young model looking for her break. She accepted a job with a man who claimed to be a photographer, but turned out to be a merciless killer. He wasn't his first victim, or his last. From the 70s through the mid 80s, the wilderness of Alaska became a popular destination as people flowed north to construct the Alaskan pipeline. The population boomed. On August 13, 1982, two off-duty Anchorage police officers were hunting moose near the Kinnick River in a wilderness about 20 miles from Anchorage. As they made their way through the dense forests, they happened upon partially buried human remains. They left it undisturbed. The next day, crime scene technicians from the Alaska State Troopers arrived at the scene. Crimes out here fell under state jurisdiction. Besides clothing and an elastic bandage, Troopers found a 223 caliber shell casing in the shallow grave. Conveniently buried here in the sand. Dental records identified the remains as 23 year old Sherry Morrow, an exotic dancer reported missing a year earlier by her boyfriend. Troopers called him in to break the news. Her clothes matched the ones he reported her missing in, but her good luck charm the gold arrowhead pendant she never took off was gone. We talked, but, uh, Morrow was probably murdered shortly after she disappeared, giving the killer more than a year to cover his tracks. Finding him would be next to impossible. In the year following the discovery of Sherry Morrow's body, more women began turning up. It's a sad truth that finding bodies in the Alaskan wilderness wasn't all that unusual. Two or three times a year, some novice hiker or hunter would get lost and succumb to the elements. But a growing number of bodies had a different story to tell. During new road construction on September 2nd, 1983, a crew hey, unearthed on. human skeletal remains not far from where Sherry Morrow's body had been found one year earlier. Hey, 
The bones had obviously been here for some time. Yet until recently, this area of the Connect River was so remote that it could only be accessed by boat or light plane. The remains were identified as 17-year-old Paula Goulding, an out-of-work secretary who had moved to Alaska from Hawaii. She had been missing for five months. Like Sherry Morrow, she had taken a job as an exotic dancer to make ends meet. And like Sherry Morrow, a 223 caliber cartridge was found at the site. For Alaska State Trooper Wayne Van Clausen, the connection was frightening. And that's about when everything started to become kind of scary for everybody because the, the profile was the same. They were, they were topless uh, dancers from, from the clubs downtown, uh, but that was certainly when there was the belief that there was a serial murderer out there. Two bodies had been found, but now troopers believed there were more. They began to revisit missing persons reports. Many of those reported missing were exotic dancers, but in Alaska, their disappearance was not unusual. Missing persons was a relatively low priority. Um, statutorily, if you're an adult, you have a right to be missing. And there were a lot of instances where these girls would just jump on a plane and go away. Between 1980 and 1983, 12 women had been reported missing. That was only a fraction of the unreported total. Troopers now wondered how many of the missing women were victims of the killer. That would be difficult to determine. The Alaska State Troopers sent the evidence from the Sherry Morrow and Paula Goulding crime scenes to the FBI's laboratory in Washington, D.C. for analysis. The FBI ran ballistics tests on both shell casings to see if they were shot from the same gun. State troopers hoped the results could provide them with strong evidence that the same person committed both murders. The lab results were conclusive. Both women were killed by the same high-powered rifle. There was little doubt Alaska troopers were dealing with a serial killer. While they began their hunt for him in the wilderness, the Anchorage police were dealing with their own problems. Every city has its dark side, and Anchorage is no different. Except that in Alaska, the nights are longer and darker. In the 70s and 80s, Anchorage was a frontier town. Men came here to work hard, and women followed to ease their loneliness. Some women were lured to the strip clubs, hoping to earn a quick buck. Others, looking for more respectable opportunities, worked in the clubs until something better came up. For many, it never did. And in the city's streets, roamed a stalker. He chose carefully. His victims were hardly missed. For in a city made up largely of strangers, it's difficult to be a missing person. Some of the women who disappeared from Anchorage turned up safely. Some didn't turn up at all. But disappearances weren't the only crimes being reported. On the early morning of June 13, 1983, Cindy Paulson, age 17, ran down an Anchorage highway. She was partially dressed and in handcuffs. She managed to flag down a passing truck. She was running for her life. The motorist dropped her off at her motel apartment. The desk clerk had called the Anchorage police. Miss Paulson? An officer removed her handcuffs and tried to calm her. You all right? Here, let me get this. Anchorage police officer Greg Baker recalls the incident. Uh, we found her in handcuffs with uh, very little clothes on. She was real credible. She was very scared. She was very frightened. And uh, she told us her story. 
Paulson, a prostitute, told Baker that she picked up a trick the night before. She described him as wiry, scruffy, about six feet tall, with glasses and a stutter. He was not the kind of person she thought of as threatening. But as soon as she stepped into his car, he handcuffed her and put a wood-handled revolver to her head. They drove to a respectable residential neighborhood. He pulled her into his house. The place was well kept and full of hunting trophies. He had a chain hanging from the ceiling of his den. He chained her up and stripped her. And there she was tortured and raped repeatedly for hours. Then he went to take a nap, leaving her there. But he wasn't through yet. He said he was going to take her to his cabin in the wilderness. He said if she tried to get anyone's attention, he'd kill her and them as well. He told her he already had his alibi worked out. His friends were willing to lie for him. No one would believe her story. They ended up at the airport. She could see him loading a weapon into a small aircraft. She also saw her chance for escape. Her one chance to save her life. The story sounded outrageous, but her genuine terror compelled Officer Baker to check it out. I had a very street smart female, scared to death, with a story about being taken at gunpoint and held prisoner at a specific location that she described where it was, so she knew where it was. She described the interior of the location, she described the den, up to and including various animals who were posted on the, uh, mounted on the wall. En route to the hospital for an examination, Paulson insisted on stopping at the airport to show police the airplane she had seen earlier. She positively identified it. While we were in there, we had a security guard stop us and describe the car the same way that uh, Cindy had described the car and in fact gave us a license number. Uh, that license number confirmed the address or the area at least, that Cindy had given us uh, regarding where the house was. Police went to the address to speak to the owner of the car. They arrived moments before he pulled up, driving the vehicle described by Cindy Paulson. So far, everything Paulson said and checked out. But the suspect had his own story to tell. According to the motor vehicle records, the car that Cindy Paulson was abducted in belonged to Robert Hansen, a baker in Anchorage. Hansen, who fit the description of the man Paulson described, calmly answered questions. He said he was at a friend's house from 5 p.m. to 11.30 p.m., repairing a seat for his airplane. Afterward, he went to the home of another friend and stayed until around 5.30 that morning. Then he went to the airport and installed the seat. Hansen gave police his consent to search his house. Again, his home was exactly as Paulson had described. That only proved she'd been in the house, not that Hansen had raped and tortured her there. They could find no evidence of that. They did notice a loose-fitting wall panel. Behind it, they found a collection of weapons, but that wasn't surprising. Hansen was an avid hunter. They did find a revolver, 
but it didn't match the one that Paulson described. The gun, the chain, and the blanket she was wrapped in were nowhere to be found. Hansen's car appeared equally clean. Anchorage police found nothing in his car that fit Paulson's story. Uh, those alibis were uh, corroborated and verified. And Mr. Hansen was released after a consent search of his house. Paulson, still shaken from her ordeal, was able to pick Hansen's picture out of a photo lineup. But when given the chance to take a lie detector test, she refused. Her occupation gave her an inherent distrust of the police and gave police an inherent distrust of her. She felt she'd never be taken seriously. Soon after, she left town for a while to try to put the nightmare behind her. Anchorage authorities were willing to let it drop too. I found out because the uh, alibis were corroborated and because they had a problem with Cindy Paulson appearing and disappearing and, of course, her lifestyle left a lot to be desired, that the case had been suspended at the Anchorage Police Department. Police had gathered no solid evidence linking her story to Robert Hansen. But for Officer Greg Baker, it wasn't over. He was one officer who believed Paulson's story and wouldn't let it go. The predator roaming the streets of Anchorage was still out there, free to claim more victims. Robert Hansen, the most likely suspect in the abduction and rape of Cindy Paulson, had been released for a lack of solid evidence. Officer Baker was still curious. Lately, the Anchorage police had been grappling with what seemed like more than their share of missing persons reports involving prostitutes like Paulson, or exotic dancers, or women out by themselves. Paulson's assertion that she was about to be put on a plane only reinforced his creeping suspicions about Hansen. He had taken her to the airport where he was going to fly her out with the story that if she maintained her, her helpfulness that uh, he'd bring her back and let her go. Well, Cindy was bright enough to know that she was on a one-way trip, and uh, so was I. And so I kind of just put two and two together and figured that he was a very good suspect for the uh, missing dancers. Baker's supervisor had suspended the investigation into Robert Hansen, but Baker couldn't let it go. Cindy Paulson's nightmarish story had too much detail to not have some basis in truth. But no one except Baker would listen to her. He continued his investigation. On the surface, Baker found nothing in Hansen's record to arouse suspicion. He had moved to Anchorage from Iowa 16 years earlier and opened a bakery. It was a huge success. He had a wife and children, and except for his stutter, he fit in completely. When he wasn't in the kitchen, Hansen enjoyed flying his small airplane, a Super Cub Piper. Back on the ground, he took to the woods. He was a solid citizen. He just didn't fit the model of a serial killer. There were plenty of others drifting through Alaska more suited to that role. They didn't have businesses, they didn't have families. Hansen did. He had everything to lose. Frank Rothschild was a prosecutor involved in the Paulson case. Bob the Baker. The troopers and the police used to go to his donut shop all the time. It was a very popular place to go. Uh, he was, he had a, a bakery. People knew him. He was friendly. Uh, he was just a hard-working guy. Unaware of Officer Greg Baker's local investigation in Anchorage, state troopers were still trying to find their serial killer. Bodies continued to be unearthed in the Alaskan wilderness. Troopers set up a task force to study the similarities between the missing women and the murder victims. They hoped to find a common thread that would lead to a suspect. Until authorities knew more, 
they did their best to educate dancers and prostitutes about playing safe. For the first time, police and prostitutes were on the same side. According to Rothschild, the goal was preservation. Law enforcement were then and had been for a time advising young women who were working in some of these clubs and uh, who were working the streets uh, to be careful and to advise them there was a, a maniac out there who, was, who seemed to be abducting and killing people. A little digging revealed that Hansen's criminal history was extensive. Twelve years earlier, in 1971, he'd been arrested twice for kidnapping, rape, and assault with a deadly weapon. They were crimes that bore an eerie resemblance to what Cindy Paulson had endured. Baker couldn't bring this information to his supervisor. The Paulson case had been officially suspended, and Baker was bucking authority. That left him no alternative. And at that time, I gathered up all the reports and background that I could find on uh, Mr. Hansen and for, carried it over to the troopers. When the troopers received the file from Officer Baker, they were optimistic. Paulson's testimony, along with Hansen's police record from Anchorage, made him a prime suspect in the state case. The troopers' investigation dovetailed with Baker's. They were both dealing with the same maniac. Robert Hansen was their best suspect. I think everybody was looking at him real seriously because he made a good suspect when you looked into him. He had uh, a pretty extensive criminal background, including some sexual assaults. The only problem was the proof. Though Hansen was a violent sex offender, his record indicated nothing about being capable of homicide, nor was there any direct link from him to Sherry Morrow, Paula Goulding, and the other missing women. At this point, troopers didn't even have enough for a search warrant. They knew only that three women were dead and 12 were missing. Out there lurked a serial killer. Troopers needed to catch him before he killed again. They needed help. We knew we had a mass murder on our hands. That was not something Alaska had any experience with. Somebody obviously knew that the FBI not only had experience with it, but had set out this unit that was designed specifically to try to assist in discovering who these people were. To catch a killer in their own backyard, the troopers called on help from over 3,000 miles away. Only the FBI had the resources needed to get inside a killer's head. When the Alaska State Troopers determined they had a serial killer on their hands, they realized they didn't have the expertise to stop him. But they knew who did. Quantico, Virginia is home to the FBI's investigative support unit. Here, agents attempt to predict behavioral patterns by analyzing a criminal's actions. Retired FBI agent John Douglas helped pioneer behavioral profiling and still works as a consultant. His profiles are based on 25 years interviewing convicted killers. They taught Douglas how to think like they do. He's learned that serial killers are acting out their fantasies of control and conquest. As Douglas slowly wins their trust, he takes them back to the scene of their crime. You finally get them talking, they start giving you that thousand yard stare. They're back. They were back 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when they were perpetrating uh, the crime. And they kind of lock into that thousand yard stare. And their memory is, is just so pr precise. And the fantasy is what keeps them going uh, over and over and, and enables them to survive when they're incarcerated. So I got to tap into that. It takes time, but once I'm in there, I get tremendous information. From these interviews, he distilled a checklist of traits and habits that serial killers share. They start young with lesser crimes such as arson or cruelty to animals. Over the years, their violence builds. To every new case, profilers bring the knowledge of how killers evolve. To understand the criminal, you must look at the crime. You just want to see if you can come up with an analysis based upon preliminary police reports, crime scene photographs, a profile of the, uh, the victim, autopsy protocol reviewing that, 
re review the autopsy photographs, do a, an analysis of the overall crime, the risk level that the subject took, uh, the victim risk level, analysis of the, the area, the, the, maybe the crime scene, maybe you have multiple crime scenes, and then uh, based upon that, uh, you attempt now to come up with a specific type of, uh, type of profile. By examining every aspect of an unsolved crime, a profiler can determine specific characteristics of that killer, such as age, occupation, and physical characteristics. The troopers contacted the FBI to see if the Bureau could work up an analysis of the Anchorage killer. They hoped the profile would sharpen the investigation and bring overlooked clues to light. The troopers gave the FBI what they needed to build the behavioral profile. For a scrupulous, accurate profile, they required only facts from the troopers, no analysis or theories. Trooper Wayne Van Clausen didn't want to lose any time. The information he received from Officer Baker aroused his suspicions about Robert Hansen, but he needed more information. Criminal records were just beginning to be computerized, and he didn't have access to them all in Anchorage. While the profile was being developed, he went to Juneau to collect Hansen's records from the Superior and Supreme Court archives. In his fact-finding mission, Van Clausen researched every town that Hansen had ever lived in. He found reports on Robert Hansen dating back to 1961. He gathered all that he could carry, sent the rest by truck, then headed home. While he was in Juneau, the FBI had come through with a criminal profile of the serial killer. The fact that the killer was so prolific meant to Douglas that he could function unnoticed within the community. Someone who worked independently, most likely a business owner. The killer would be an avid outdoorsman since the bodies were recovered in remote areas of wilderness. Since he preyed on prostitutes, Douglas concluded the killer had difficulty talking to women, had low self-esteem, and grew up feeling like an outcast. Based on killers with similar profiles, Douglas provided a specific characteristic to explain the cause of those feelings of inadequacy a feature that bore an eerie resemblance to Robert Hansen. The one that totally blew us all away, I think, is that when they, when they said he's either going to be, be a stutterer or someone who has a lisp, a speech defect, how do you figure that? But that was one of the things that they suggested might show up. The FBI profile pointed to Robert Hansen, but the depths of Douglas's insight were about to be known. Upon Van Clausen's return, troopers studied the files. The records showed that Hansen had spent three years in a reformatory for setting fire to his old high school's bus garage. Based on their work with previous killers, the FBI profilers said the killer would have a history of arson. You have a boyfriend? Yes, actually, I do. Yeah, because The profile painted the killer as a social misfit. Hansen's court-ordered psychiatric reports from his days at the reformatory bore this out. I'm really busy right now, you know? I don't, I don't mean anything like, I mean, you know. His stutter was a social barrier that undermined his self-confidence. Whenever he tried to assert himself, he'd be slapped down. work to do, or I'm gonna call security on you. He never forgot the sting. The profile said the killer would learn to function as a normal member of society while his perversions festered within. His record showed that in his 30s, Hansen began working at a bakery. He would brag to co-workers about his kleptomania and the sense of power it gave him. He also bragged about his love of hunting. He took great pleasure in exerting power over his prey, stalking it, then wounding it. And he became good at the kill, winning prestigious awards. In 1967, he moved to Alaska to start a new life and for better hunting. 
Three years after moving there, his record showed he was arrested for the attempted rape of a young receptionist at gunpoint. He pleaded no contest to assault with a deadly weapon. A little more than a month later, he was indicted for the attempted assault of an 18-year-old woman he'd followed home. As soon as the man got to Alaska, he was involved in theft cases, he was involved in abductions, he uh, had psych psychiatric evaluations showing him to be really unstable and having all kinds of weird sexual fantasies and the rest. True to the profile, Hansen seemed a respectable citizen, so the courts were lenient. In one case, he claimed to have memory lapses and was given psychiatric treatment and five years in a work release program. He abducted one of his early victims outside a coffee shop, took her to a cabin in the wilderness, and raped her at gunpoint. She was 17 at the time. He told me, of course, if I called the police, that he would hunt me down and kill me. He told me he was a fine, outstanding businessman. He had never mentioned at any point when, uh, during the rape time or, or before or after that he was married, but he said he's a fine, outstanding businessman and that I was just a kid and nobody would believe me. And he was right. Everything the profiler said about the perpetrator of the serial killings fits suspect Robert Hansen, a truly dangerous man who was passing as a nondescript face in the crowd. While troopers zeroed in on Hansen, they spread out to search for more victims in the Knick River area, where three bodies had been found. They believed that the dancers who were still missing may have been buried close to the other grave sites. But troopers came up empty. The area was too large and remote to cover completely. Despite the compelling FBI profile and the past police records, troopers lacked anything tangible to link Hansen to the killings. His police records were too stale, the evidence too circumstantial to hold any weight in a court of law. Investigators hoped that Cindy Paulson could help. She was the only surviving victim to Hansen's current wave of violence. Perhaps she could remember something else from her ordeal. Paulson gave another statement. But this time, she was able to ID one of the guns Hansen had in his possession. Aside from Paulson, Hansen had not been implicated in a rape or abduction for more than 10 years. But in the hopes of strengthening their case and establishing a pattern of behavior, investigators searched for another of Hansen's victims from years earlier, whose experience matched Paulson's. Although this prior victim no longer lived in the area, troopers tracked her down and asked for her help. I had gotten a call from Alaska asking if uh, I would like to maybe help with a conviction for uh, Mr. Hansen. Uh, they had explained to me that he had killed, to the best of their knowledge, seven women. And they explained to me that the last woman had broken free. She agreed to testify when the time came, but troopers still had a weak case. The troopers felt confident they were on the right track. They didn't have enough to prove that Hansen was a serial killer. According to Anchorage Police Officer Greg Baker, Hansen knew that authorities were on to something. One morning I was driving by and I needed to get some donuts for the shift. Mr. Hansen was there and he had a, uh, a window that he stood in and decorated cakes and cupcakes and cookies. And I remember watching him. He kept looking up at me, and you could tell he was nervous. And he kept putting frosting on his thumb. And I liked that. What we'll do is Although investigators had Hansen in their sights, they still lacked the evidence to connect him directly to the crimes. But because Hansen matched the profile so closely, Douglas flew to Alaska to review the case and to brief the troopers and prosecutor Frank Rothschild 
on how to proceed with the suspect. Douglas was confident that Hanson was their serial killer. The hunter was now the hunted. So the mission was to provide a, a analysis for them. Does he have the capability to commit a crime like this? And the answer was, was yes. I believe this prostitute, and uh, I believe he's capable of perpetrating these crimes. Douglas's idea was to bring Hanson in for questioning while simultaneously searching his house. To obtain a warrant, investigators needed to list specific items they believed to be in the house. They knew to look for the gun that Cindy Paulson described and the one that fired the bullets found in the graves of Sherry Morrow and Paula Goulding. That wasn't enough. They needed a home run, something that would prove Hanson's guilt in no uncertain terms. They asked Douglas if there was anything else to list in the warrant. Yes, uh, some of the research findings is we're dealing here with a serial killer. And serial killers, uh, it starts off as fantasy. And one of the things to keep the fantasy going after the crime is, is because they're on the hunt nightly looking for victims, is they take some type of me memento. We call them either souvenirs or trophies, something belonging to the victims. Douglas helped prosecutors write the affidavit based on the likelihood of finding mementos mentioned in the profile. Okay, anything else? I've got those two. Anything from a piece of the victim's jewelry to a driver's license. We don't have any but a behavioral profile had never been used as the basis of a search warrant in the United States before. Rothschild knew he'd need to back it up with more conventional information. Obviously, the district attorney's office wanted this search warrant to be bulletproof. They wanted it to be absolutely, positively, uh, without flaw uh, because they knew this was a big, big case. The last thing they wanted was to have something wrong with the search warrant and have all the evidence thrown out. The affidavit swelled to 48 pages. The judge granted eight search warrants for Hanson's property. Now, they just needed Hanson. They had learned his pattern knew his schedule. On October 23rd, 1983, they went to pick him up at his bakery. But Hanson wasn't there. He'd gotten off to a late start, unwittingly keeping the troopers waiting 20 tense minutes. Robert Hanson. Robert Hanson. We'll ask the police, sir. Can you step away from your car? When asked to come in for questioning, he didn't resist. The interrogation room was ready for him. The goal was to keep him off balance, hoping to elicit a confession and avoid a lengthy legal case. Douglas helped the troopers design the interrogation room for the biggest psychological impact. Crime scene photos and related materials were strewn everywhere for Hanson to contemplate before his interview. At the appointed moment, the troopers arrived, well, and the Hansen. mind game began. Mr. Hanson? The FBI coached Rothschild on how to play it. Ask him questions in a way that would prompt more discussion. Robert so that, that's game plan number one. Then obviously, we've got all of these cases that have been investigated. And to get him to talk specifically about those, He's trying to search us out. What do we know? So I could see his game plan was to kind of find out what we knew and uh, play off of that. And my game plan, of course, is to find out what he knew. While Rothschild tried to get Hanson to open up and confess, troopers served the search warrants. Hanson's wife was home. The troopers were extra cautious, videotaping the entire procedure. What they were looking for could be anywhere, even in plain sight. Hanson knew the troopers had access to his police and psychological records. He didn't tell authorities anything they didn't already know. He spoke of his painful upbringing, his strict family, his anger. He admitted to picking up dancers and prostitutes in the early 70s, and how enraged he became when they tried to raise their prices. 
but he denied threatening any of them. He admitted nothing. While Hansen told his story and his house was being turned inside out, other troopers headed to his bakery and to the airport to search his plane. Both were clean. The house became the focal point of the investigation. A careful search of the upstairs bedroom finally yielded a curious and eerie discovery. An aerial map of the region, peppered with 37 X's. They seemed to be clustered mainly around the area where bodies had been found. But there were dozens more marks than bodies, at least so far. The searchers continued up to the attic. Under insulation, the troopers found weapons. Among the items found were a 223 Ruger Mini 14 rifle, like the one used to kill Sherry Morrow and Paula Goulding, and a wood handled revolver resembling the one described by Cindy Paulson. Yeah. The search team let Van Clausen know the good news. Sounds good. These women look familiar? Have you ever seen them? The net was closing on Hansen, and he knew it. But he wasn't ready to talk just yet. Take another look. The interview dragged on for hours. It didn't seem like a confession was likely. I, I, I haven't I've never seen them. While troopers collected the evidence, the case unwound even further. Hansen's friend and neighbor stopped by, curious about the activity. She was stunned by the news, then made a confession that demolished the last of Hansen's story. She told troopers that her husband provided Hansen with his alibi on the night of Cindy Paulson's abduction. He'd lied to protect his friend, not realizing how serious Hansen's charges were. The husband later called police and retracted his statement. Hansen's alibi evaporated. As the search continued, the troopers found the most incriminating evidence so far. Evidence that Douglas knew had to be there somewhere. They found Sherry Morrow's necklace and other personal property belonging to the dead or missing women. They had found Hansen's stash of trophies. Yeah, this is Baker here. Investigators called the station. Though they had Hansen where they wanted him, still he wouldn't confess. But they had enough to lock him up on the Cindy Paulson case. Bail was set at $500,000. Investigators now had time to build their case against Hansen as a serial killer. They called the prior victim to see if she was still on board. And at that time, they thought he had killed 11 women. And was I still interested in, in being a witness? They, they really felt that they may need me because he hadn't confessed. All right, what you got? Great. Three points on the map found in his bedroom matched the locations of bodies recovered by the troopers. Another X marked the location of a body recovered by Seward police years earlier. The remaining Xs presumably marked the graves of more victims, dozens of them. Looking at the map obviously was pretty chilling because we believed the map. The map was a body count, as far as we were concerned. The man had kept track. He didn't have newspaper clippings. He had the map. When the troopers believed they had enough to convict Hansen on at least four murders, they confronted him and his lawyer with the evidence. Hansen couldn't refute it. He had no place left to hide. Finally, it was time to confess. Time for Hansen to cut a deal. Hansen said he would confess to the murders that could be proven, as long as the trial was given no publicity and that his family be left alone. He demanded that he be imprisoned outside of Alaska when the trial was over. In exchange for only four convictions, he agreed to show the troopers where more bodies were buried. Investigators called the prior victim to tell her the good news. 
the third time they called back and said that he had confessed and they wouldn't need me. So um, I hung up the phone when we were done talking, I got my son off to school, got my husband out the door, and um, proceeded to fall apart. I started crying. I couldn't stop. I had no control over it. It controlled me. I could see each and every one of those women, how they died, probably hunted down like dogs, wounded and then hunted more. In his confession, Hansen described how he would take his victims into the woods and hunt them as prey. Over the dozen years that he lived in Alaska, he'd raped more than 30 women and developed many strategies for capturing them. Once he found a likely target, a solitary woman like Sherry Morrow, he would befriend her and arrange to meet her at a fast food place. If they were dancers or aspiring models, he'd offer to pay to photograph them. He'd arrive early and stay in his car. That way he'd be certain the woman arrived alone and had no one waiting for her in the parking lot. No witnesses. Then he'd go in and meet his new victim. fastened to the seat. Hansen boasted that snapping the other half onto his victim's wrist while reaching for his gun became like a reflex. Then he would take them home or to a remote motel to rape and torture them. Afterwards, he'd blindfold them and drive or fly them to the outskirts of town until he arrived at a secluded spot, his hunting ground. His habit was to toy with his prey before he made the kill. Hansen confessed that in the summer of 83, he devised what he called his summer plan. He sent his family away so he could bring his victims home. When he was done with them, he'd dispose of them in the wilderness. On February 27, 1984, Robert Hansen was convicted of murdering four women and sentenced to 461 years plus life with no chance of parole. After his sentencing, Hansen accompanied troopers into the field to find more of his victims, represented by X's on his map. A total of eight victims were found. Some places on the map went unexplored. Bears scavenged others, scattering the remains. Investigators will never know how many of the 37 X's represented one of Hansen's victims. According to John Douglas, the map might have depicted only a small part of his hunting grounds. Killers like Hans will come into contact with a lot of women, but Fantasy is everything, and they may not like the way the, the, the person talks or the person dresses, uh, the style, and um, you know, so they'll make a decision. Well, this one will live, this one over here will, you know, will die. I believe he was good for a lot more cases. And I still believe there was a chance that one of the reasons that caused him to go up to Alaska, was he was running away from homicides back in the lower 48. In the United States, an estimated 35 to 50 serial killers are active at any given time. Profiling has made them easier to spot and apprehend. Each time one is captured, investigators learn more about their twisted motivations, making it easier to catch the next one.
Biloxi, Mississippi. A quiet southern town with a burning core of corruption. In 1987, its secret burst violently to the surface, leaving two prominent citizens dead and ripping the top off a grand conspiracy. On Mississippi's Gulf Coast, a judge and his politician wife are murdered in their home. The killer left few clues. It looked like a professional hit, and the investigation led nowhere. But the FBI refused to give up. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Until we could prove that federal laws had been broken, our hands were tied. It would take years to break the conspiracy of silence and reveal the tangled tale of corruption. Biloxi, Mississippi, Monday, September 14th, 1987. It was a typically warm summer night in this quiet Gulf Coast town. The workday was over, and most residents had retreated to the tranquility of their homes. Like most of their neighbors, State Circuit Court Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife Margaret were unwinding after a long day. Vincent Sherry was a prominent judge in Biloxi. Margaret was making plans to run for mayor. Both were fixtures at Biloxi's social and community functions. They were a happy couple who had raised three grown children. Tomorrow they planned to visit their daughter out of state. Their life together seemed ideal. They were just settling in for the night when an unexpected visitor came to the door. And brought their perfect world to an end. The Sherrys were supposed to be with their daughter, so no one realized anything was wrong until two days later when the judge failed to show up in court on Wednesday, September 16th. Calls to the Sherrys' home went unanswered. His colleagues at the court phoned Pete Hallett, Vincent Sherry's friend and former law partner. Morning, Pete Hallett. But he hadn't seen yeah. or heard from the judge either. Well, he's supposed to be in court. When did he leave? I don't know. No, wait, you let me call him at home and I'll, I'll figure out where he is. After he left a concerned message on the Sherry's answering machine, Halat felt he'd better check on his friend personally. Oh, I got the machine. Judge! Judge, it's Pete. They're looking for you in court. Is everything okay? On his way out, he asked his junior partner, Charles Legere, to ride with him. Charlie, I need some help, so let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I'll give you a call back, okay? Yeah. Bye-bye. I figure if we go together, the two of us will find As they drove, Legere tried to make conversation. Uh, well, that seemed distant, 
perhaps concerned about the judge. Both of the Sherry's cars stood in the driveway. Well, the car's here. I don't like it. I don't like it. Well, the car's here. He's supposed to be in court. Halat asked Legier to go to the house while he asked a neighbor if she'd seen the couple. Just go ahead. Azir rang the doorbell, but no one answered. He saw that the last two morning newspapers hadn't been picked up. Pete Halat, I'm a partner. The neighbor told Halat she hadn't seen the Sherry's for a couple of days, which she thought was odd since both of their cars were in the driveway. When Legier tried the Sherry's door, he found it unlocked. Something wasn't right. Hey, Pete! Pete! I think that's unusual. Yeah, I was uh, just knocking on it and the door opened up. Halat, concerned by the Never open door, the door open, cautiously stepped inside. A few steps in, he made the gruesome discovery. Judge Sherry had been gunned down in his own home. He was wrong. They called the police. Authorities arrived to find the body of Vincent Sherry at the front of the house. In the back bedroom, they discovered Margaret. Because the couple was so prominent, the murder investigation became top priority. Detectives contacted the FBI's Biloxi field office. Though the FBI would not yet be officially involved, they offered the use of their agents and forensic laboratory. Inside, the police began scouring the crime scene for clues. They conducted blood spatter analysis to determine projectile angles. If they could figure out where the murderer had stood when he fired the shots, they might be able to reconstruct the crime. Okay. Inspector Robert Burris, a crime technician with the Biloxi Police Department, helped process the scene. He discovered a possible clue in the den. There was blood trailing from his feet, actually going down between his legs a little ways, uh, back to where he was laying. There was blood spatter on um, a double sliding glass door that was right beyond his head. And for other examination in this room, I found some um, small pieces of foam rubber. Burris didn't see where the foam rubber could have come from. A search of the house led him to one conclusion. Now this foam rubber had to have been brought into the house. We examined every piece of material in this house and every room of the house, all pillows, mattresses, everything else. There's no foam rubber tore up in this house. It was brought into the house. It does have gunshot residue on it. And basically, about the only way it can get there is for a bullet to be fired through it. For Burris, the significance of the foam rubber was obvious. The killer had used a homemade silencer. Investigators dusted for fingerprints, but found none of any value. They found nine spent 22 caliber shell casings from a semi-automatic pistol as well as the bullets used to murder the Sherrys. The position of the shells indicated that the shots had been fired in rapid succession. But most striking was how well the killer had covered his tracks. Nothing at the scene pointed to the killer's identity. 
So what do you think? He did his job well, and his mission was clear. The lack of evidence in this house, such as uh, items stolen, uh, a struggle occurring, the absence of forced entry, uh, no ransacking going on in the house whatsoever, a person came there for one thing, that was to kill the two Sherrys. Special Agent Keith Bell from the Biloxi FBI field office agreed that this was a professional job. The Sherrys had been assassinated. The crime scene appeared to be very limited as far as evidence remaining, which meant it was well planned, well executed, and professionally done. A uh, small caliber weapon had been used. Uh, the uh, foam rubber indicated that uh, perhaps a silencer had also been used, and the Sherry's had been uh, shot in the head. So uh, it, it seemed to be a very professional job. A multi-agency task force was assembled with Special Agent Keith Bell among its members. Investigators would spend days processing the crime scene. They grappled with a single question. Why had the Sherrys been murdered? That was one of the main questions, uh, that being why were both Judge Sherry and Margaret Sherry murdered? Because it was fairly obvious that Judge Sherry could have been killed during his morning or afternoon jogs around the neighborhood. Uh, so it was a real mystery why Margaret had been killed. Investigators believe the answer might lie in the controversy over Biloxi's future. Some civic leaders hope to transform the sleepy southern town on Mississippi's Gulf Coast into a flashy resort where casinos would attract tourist dollars. But with strip clubs already established in town, Margaret Sherry felt Biloxi's small town charms were threatened and the casinos would attract a criminal element. As a candidate for mayor, she had made powerful political enemies by trying to keep gambling out. Agent Bell wondered if Margaret was killed to silence her protests. Margaret had been so outspoken politically in the community. Uh, she was known to be anti-gambling. And uh, if elected mayor in 1989, she had planned to close down the remaining strip clubs in Biloxi. So there was always the possibility that she might have been the target rather than Judge Sherry. The task force would investigate Margaret's political enemies, but first they'd question the Sherry's friends and neighbors. Someone in the neighborhood must have seen something. But even people who'd known the Sherrys for years were reluctant to talk, fearing the specter of Biloxi's emerging criminal underworld. The Sherry murders brought a dark cloud over the city of Biloxi. Uh, many of the citizens in Biloxi were uh, afraid to openly express their opinions. They saw that Margaret Sherry, who had been quite vocal, and quite outspoken in political circles, had ended up dead, as had her prominent husband, Judge Sherry. So many citizens, uh, after these murders, uh, were hesitant even to be interviewed by FBI agents or by local police officers because they basically did not want their names tied in to anything to do with this case. If people wouldn't talk to the authorities, perhaps they would talk to Lynn Spazito, the Sherry's daughter. After being notified of her parents' murders, Lynn rushed to Biloxi from her home in North Carolina. Determined to find justice, she questioned everyone in the neighborhood. One family friend gave her a crucial piece of information. He described a suspicious car and driver in the neighborhood on the night of the murders. She took the lead to the police. They identified a man who had seen a suspicious Ford Fairmont driving in front of the Sherry home on Monday night, September 14, 1987. 
Investigators tried to determine the identity of the driver based on the witness's description. Their search came up empty. But a few days later, not far from the Sherry's home, investigators found an abandoned car, a Ford Fairmont. A check on the vehicle's identification number showed it had been reported stolen the day before the murders. Police also learned that the tags on the car were not registered to the car. Realizing that this vehicle was probably the killer's getaway car, investigators towed it to a police garage to examine it further. Somewhere in the car, they hoped to find a key to the killer's identity. Less than a week after the brutal murders of Biloxi couple Vince and Margaret Sherry, investigators received their first promising lead. They recovered an abandoned car, matching the one witnesses described seeing the night of the murders. After contacting agent Keith Bell about the discovery, investigators processed the car for clues. Inspector Robert Burris found something peculiar. I was processing this vehicle, and one of the things I noted, the dome light had been dismantled and the bulb taken out of it. In other words, if you open the door, you ain't got no light. Both of the sun visors were in the down position. Whether you're riding around daytime or nighttime, you ain't gonna be able to see the people's face in it very well. Investigators believed more than ever that this was the car used by the Sherry's killer. Anything found inside it was labeled, packaged, and shipped yeah. to the FBI labs in Washington, D.C. But FBI lab examiners would find nothing of evidentiary value. After Agent Bell arrived, he examined the license tag more closely. He discovered it had its own story to tell. It was determined that the tag on the Ford Fairmont had been stolen from an abandoned vehicle in 1984, actually three years before these murders occurred. So what it meant was someone had removed the license plate, likely in 1984, had kept the license plate, and then when this major crime in the city of Biloxi was uh, to occur, they pulled it off the shelf, so to speak. With no other solid evidence, investigators hoped that following the trail of the stolen tag might lead to the killer. It was traced to an apartment complex where the original car had been abandoned three years earlier. Investigators contacted the apartment manager, who told them that prior to having the vehicle towed, he called a friend to come and strip it for parts. The manager's friend, was a man that agents knew by name and reputation. Biloxi locksmith Lenny Sweatman. He was the last person to be seen near the car. Sweatman belonged to a loosely organized group of criminals the FBI was investigating in connection with another case. The group was known as the Dixie Mafia. FBI agent Keith Bell had connected the car used in the Sherry killings to Lenny Sweatman. Now, Bell wondered if the Dixie Mafia was linked to the Sherry murders. If Sweatman had a part in it, Bell believed that other Dixie Mafia members couldn't be far behind. He began looking into Sweatman's associates. What that meant to us immediately, uh, those of us familiar with the criminal associations on the coast, was that if Lenny Sweatman was involved in getting the tag for the hit car, then quite likely his close personal friend and longtime associate Mike Gillich, the strip club owner in Biloxi, might also be involved in these murders. That's all right. Sometimes you know how it is. Oh, thanks. Oh, beer. All right. Gillich, who owned three strip clubs in Biloxi, was well known to local law enforcement. He was currently under investigation by the FBI in connection with a Dixie Mafia operation known as the Lonely Heart Scam. See, he gets to it. 
but Special Agent Bell needed a thread that connected the two investigations together. He started by familiarizing himself with the Lonely Heart scan. It was run out of Angola prison in Louisiana by a man named Kirksey Nix, the incarcerated kingpin of the Dixie Mafia. No, the first model. Nix would run ads in gay magazines, asking for money to help fictional gay men get out of trouble with the law. Through the scan, Nix was hoping to generate enough money to solve his own legal problems. He was serving a life sentence for murder. From his jail cell at Angola, he coordinated what we've been referring to as the homosexual scam, which generated hundreds of thousands of dollars from individuals around the country, uh, as well as some people in Canada. Uh, with this money, he intended to buy his way out, or attempt to buy his way out, of his uh, Louisiana prison sentence. Believing that they were helping gay men out of trouble, people who read the magazine ads would wire or mail money to a nearby Western Union. Nix would then call his contact on the outside, Mike Gillich. Gillich would then dispatch his bagman to retrieve the money. Gillich made sure that the scam money was distributed to Dixie Mafia members and safely stashed away for Kirksey Nix. Take care. In the coming months, investigators developed more evidence in the Lonely Heart scam, but still had no direct link between these conspirators and the Sherry's killers. A year into the investigation, the murder case threatened to stop. As the years stretched to 16 months, the Sherry's daughter, Lynn Spazito, grew increasingly frustrated. In January 1989, she hired a private investigator to rev up the inquest into her parents' murder. He said he could make out the man. I'll give him a call, and I'll be on this case this afternoon. The family had wanted very much to have a quick resolution to the case, but by uh, early 1989, there'd still been no arrest. And of course, at this point, the FBI had not formally uh, entered the case. The lack of official FBI involvement hampered Bell's investigation. So when the private investigator paid him a visit, Bell welcomed his assistants, hoping they could share information. The two were old acquaintances from the private investigator's days in law enforcement. Since Agent Bell was unable to act officially, the private investigator would pursue a lead that looked promising. He would interview another Angola inmate. The private investigator and Bell hoped the inmate at Angola could finally link the Lonely Heart scam and the Sherry murders. He uh, met with all the right people, and because of his knowledge of the Dixie Mafia uh, and from what he had learned from law enforcement authorities on the coast, he did go over to Angola and did talk to the right person over there. The inmate's name was Bobby Joe Fabian. He was another known member of the Dixie Mafia, doing time for kidnapping and shooting a state trooper. Fabian claimed he had not been involved in the Sherry murders, but he had learned that fellow inmate Kirksey Nix had been. Fabian told the private investigator that Nix had had Judge Sherry killed because Sherry had allegedly stolen money from Nix's Lonely Heart scam. That wasn't all. He said Nix had been told of the theft by none other than Pete Halat, Sherry's former law partner. Halat the man who had delivered the eulogy at the Sherry's funeral was now implicated in their murders. Halat officially represented Nix on legal matters, but Fabian said Halat's role in the Lonely Heart scam was criminal, not legal. Halat was one of the people receiving money from Nix for safekeeping through Mike Gillich's bagman. 
don't forget to pick up next week. At the other place. And the ties between the outlaw and the lawyer went deep. Kirksey Nix's girlfriend and accomplice, LaRae Sharp, worked in Halat's office. Fabian said both LaRae Sharp and Pete Halat were stashing money from the scam in a safe deposit box for Kirksey Nix. And he said the amount had reached six figures. Thanks to Fabian, the link between the murders and the Lonely Heart scam had been made. And not only had Fabian given investigators a possible motive for the killings, he was also able to supply the name of the alleged hitman, an ex-con named John Ransom, who was believed to be living in Georgia. But tracking down Ransom would take time. Anytime law enforcement uh, people get together and start talking about notorious Dixie Mafia members, John Ransom comes up quite early in the conversation. He's a longtime alleged hitman for the Dixie Mafia. In August of 1989, two years after the Sherry murders, Agent Bell now had enough evidence to warrant a full FBI investigation into the killings. Accompanied by the Sherry's daughter, Lynn Spazito, he approached the United States Attorney and the FBI with a demand to officially open the case. So with the tying in of the scam to the murders, we knew we had some federal violations involved. We have uh, wire fraud, we had mail fraud, and we perhaps had a hitman traveling from Georgia to Mississippi to kill the Sherry's. Uh, it was decided to open an official FBI investigation and join with local authorities in the investigation. By now, however, suspect Pete Halat, Judge Sherry's former law partner, had been elected mayor of Biloxi. With a key suspect in such a high position, investigators encountered new roadblocks. It became very difficult for the FBI to share all of its information with the local authorities. We are not uh, saying that the local police were corrupt. What we are saying is that Mayor Halat put his own people in as director of public safety and as police chief. So we were somewhat circumspect on what we, we shared uh, with local authorities during that time period. In August of 1989, as investigators attempted to unravel the truth about the Sherry's murders, informant Bobby Joe Fabian made a surprise move. He told his story about the Sherry murders to the TV news. Fabian hoped that by bringing attention to himself, Kirksey Nix would be less likely to have him killed for cooperating with authorities. Along with the report, the station broadcast a mugshot of John Ransom, the alleged hitman in the Sherry case. When Charles Legier, Pete Halat's junior partner, saw the photo, it surprised him. He recalled seeing Ransom outside the Sherry Halat law offices a few weeks before the murders. Hello. Legier shared his information with the task force. Major Randy Cook of the Harrison County Sheriff's Department took Legier's statement. Legier said the reason he remembered Ransom was Ransom stepped off of a curb and came up to him and asked him where had spent Sherry's office at. When Legier was interviewed, me. he recalled there was something unusual about the way Ransom stepped off of the curb. Ransom had a prosthesis on one leg. Investigators learned that Ransom was now in a Georgia prison, serving time for another murder. When questioned about the Sherry murders, he refused to cooperate. 
As Cook further questioned Legier about the day he and Halat had found the bodies, an important detail emerged. Legier remembered that Halat had walked into the Sherry's living room, seen Judge Sherry's body, and said, Vince and Margaret are dead. Cook relayed this to Agent Bell. What was interesting was that Margaret's body was in the far back bedroom of the residence. And according to Chuck Legere, Pete Halat did not have time uh, other than to briefly enter the front of the house and would have no way of knowing that Margaret's body was also in the very back bedroom. In October of 1989, two years after the murders, Agent Bell knew Halat was involved but he still lacked enough evidence for an arrest. Even so, he felt it was time to confront Mayor Halat. It would be a quiet warning, man to man. And I let Mayor Halat know that I thought his knowledge of the Sherry murders was much greater than uh, what he had shared with law enforcement authorities up to that point. And I recall also telling him that the FBI would continue working on this case until it was totally solved. Uh, my recollection is he smiled and did not have much else to say. As a lawyer, Halad knew Bell would need more concrete evidence in order to secure a conviction. What he likely didn't realize was the depth of Bell's commitment to bring him to justice. Three years had passed since Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife Margaret were murdered in their Biloxi, Mississippi home. FBI Special Agent Keith Bell had connected the killings to members of the Dixie Mafia and to Judge Sherry's friend and one-time law partner, Pete Halat. The alleged trigger man, John Ransom, was refusing to talk. In January of 1990, Agent Bell and Major Randy Cook of the Harrison County Sheriff's Department drove to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary to question another possible accomplice. This is special agent. A man named Bill Rhodes. Rhodes, a known associate of John Ransom, was willing to cooperate. He told them that in early 1987, Ransom had contacted him about driving the getaway car in a crime to take place in southern Mississippi. Ransom had said a judge would be murdered and that the pay was $10,000. There were certain promises made to Rhodes that, by Ransom that I know certain people in Biloxi that if you'll help me on this and you'll have the run of Biloxi anytime you want it. So in March of 1987, Rhodes went to Biloxi and met with Ransom and a man named Pete. It was Pete who specifically asked Rhodes and Ransom to do the hit. Rhodes said he also met with Mike Gillich, the Biloxi strip club owner, who would supply the money once the hit was done. But five months later, before they could do the job, Rhodes was arrested on an unrelated bank robbery charge. And Ransom got cold feet, afraid Rhodes would turn on him. The information helped the case inch forward, but Agent Bell and Officer Cook still felt that Ransom held the missing pieces. Another year would pass without much progress. In late 1990, the investigators went to the Bostick Correctional Institute in Georgia, where Ransom was serving time. Finally, Ransom agreed to talk. He admitted that he delivered a 22 caliber pistol to LaRae Sharp, Kirksey Nix's girlfriend. But Ransom insisted that he did not do the job. Based on what Ransom said, LaRae's involvement was starting to look bigger than simply stashing scam money in a safe Sir. deposit box. Sure. All finished? Finished, thank you. Good. Through his contact with Sharp, Nix learned that the investigation was heating up. 
He worried that his girlfriend might talk. So he tried to head off the problem by putting out a contract on her life. But in late 1990, Agent Bell arrested her for her participation in the murders, inadvertently saving her from Nix's gunman. During a polygraph test, Sharp denied her involvement in the Lonely Heart scam and the Sherry murders. But the machine called her bluff. When Bell and his team added her statements to their existing stacks of evidence, they were ready to bring indictments against several key players. Mike Gillich, John Ransom, Ray Sharp, and Kirksey Nix were charged as conspirators in the Sherry murders. Notably missing from the list was Pete Halat. The case against Halat would have to wait until they had enough evidence for a murder conviction. For now, the FBI would look to convict the others on conspiracy to commit murder. So many of the questions came up, why didn't y'all indict Pete Halat early on when you indicted everybody else? Well, at the time, we didn't have the hard evidence that you would have to have to arrest a mayor and prosecute him. The conspiracy trial produced several key witnesses that would help investigators piece together the complex scheme. Robbie Gant, Gillich's bag man for the Lonely Heart scam, testified for the prosecution. His testimony helped prosecutors link the Sherry murders to the scam. All four defendants were found guilty. Nix was given 15 years in addition to the life sentence he was already serving for murder. Gillich also received a 15-year prison term. Ransom got 10 years, and LaRae Sharp won. With these conspirators behind bars and the Lonely Heart scam no longer operational, Bell moved on to his next objective. We decided not to end the Sherry investigation after the 1991 uh, initial convictions because at that time we had not proven who had actually uh, shot the Sherrys. And also Pete Halat had not been indicted or convicted at that point. And we all felt strongly that Pete Halat had played a, ma a major role in the scam and in the murder plot. So we were determined to continue the investigation to see if we could get enough evidence to indict and convict Mr. Halat and the actual shooter. In late July of 1992, Agent Bell got the break he was looking for. Following the conspiracy trial, Mike Gillich was desperate to find a way out of prison. He contacted one of his associates in Biloxi Hello? and asked him to approach Robbie Gant with an offer. Gant told Agent Bell about and the associate had offered Robbie Gant $20,000 if Gant would recant his testimony against Gillich and sign a false affidavit stating that he had been threatened by me to testify against Gillich, uh, to testify falsely against Gillich. Gant agreed to wear a wire and get the offer from Gillich's accomplice on tape. Gant met with him in Mississippi. This time, Gant's tape was rolling when Gillich's associate reiterated the bribe. Gant accepted as Bell had instructed.
Now, Bell had the evidence he needed to turn up the heat on Gillich. Just the man who could tell the story from the inside. By 1993, six years after the double murder of Vince and Margaret Sherry, FBI agent Keith Bell had put four members of the Dixie Mafia behind bars. But he still had no formal murder convictions against those involved. And Mayor Pete Halat, the suspected mastermind of the case, was still free and running the city of Biloxi. In fact, the year before, Mayor Halat had broken ground on the city's first big casino. The victory for our town and our people. The press still hounded Halat about his involvement in the Sherry murders, but he remained adamant about his innocence. Bell continued to work his plan. He used the bribe Robert Gant had recorded on tape to level another charge against Mike Gillich, already in jail. Now Bell indicted Gillich for witness bribery and witness tampering for trying to buy off Gant. And that did the trick. No doubt the most important uh, turning point was in October of 1993, when Mike Gillich finally decided to cooperate and tell the story of this whole case from an insider's point of view. And that's what really uh, allowed us to bring final resolution to this investigation. After the years of painstaking work Bell had spent on the case, it was a satisfying moment. Finally, it seemed his patience and ingenuity were paying off. Gillich was in no hurry to accrue more jail time. Bell's relentless pressure had persuaded him to cut a deal before the bribery trial even began. The Dixie Mafia member would tell what he knew about the murders. Mr. Gillich has Maybe now, Bell could get the convictions he knew were long overdue. But for a career criminal like Mike Gillich, Adjusting to life on the right side of the law wasn't easy. At first, he tried to bluff his way out. Of course, it always takes some time, a period of weeks, to develop some degree of uh, trust and to be able to uh, communicate with someone like this who, for the first time, has decided to leave his lifelong role as uh, a criminal and start cooperating with the FBI. When deception didn't work, Gillich had no alternative. He had to tell the truth. Now, for the first time, Bell heard the story from an inside source. Gillich knew all the details. Mike was the center point. Mike knew Kirksey Nix. Mike knew Pete Hallett for years. And in fact, when Kirksey Nix was looking for an attorney over in the coast area to represent him on various matters, Mike Gillich introduced Nix into Pete Hallett. He confirmed that Pete Hallett was indeed behind the plan to murder the Sherrys and that the plot grew directly out of the Lonely Heart scam of Angola prison inmate Kirksey Nix. Some months before the Sherry's deaths, Halat had closed the safe deposit box he and Nix's girlfriend, Larray Sharp, had access to, effectively cutting off her access to the money. He then transferred the money into a box only he and Judge Sherry could use. Motivated by greed, he stole $100,000 cash from there. As Nix's trusted accomplice, Halat could blame the theft on Judge Sherry. Next, he went to Mike Gillich with news of the theft. Mr. Gillich stated that Pete Halat approached Mr. Gillich himself in late 1986 and told Mr. Gillich that much of the money was missing, supposedly around $100,000. 
and Mr. Allatt blamed Judge Sherry for taking the money. Uh, Mr. Allatt knew that Kirksey Nix would be very furious about this. It is not known who ordered Margaret's death, but as a fierce opponent of corruption, she posed a threat to the underworld forces hoping to control Biloxi. With Margaret dead, Palat could be free to run the town. Gillett said that he and Halat planned the murders. Ransom and Rhodes provided the murder weapon. But when they passed on doing the hit, Gillich found a replacement, a Texas-based petty criminal named Thomas Holcomb. Holcomb would be paid $20,000 to murder Judge Sherry and his wife. Gillich had also helped provide the car with the help of locksmith Lenny Sweatman. In October of 1996, agents arrested hitman Thomas Holcomb in Texas on murder charges. Peter, that same down. month Go also down. saw the arrest that Agent Bell had anticipated and worked nine years to achieve. I'm an innocent man, and you're gonna put the cuffs on me? Let me read you your rights. The arrest of Pete Halat for the murders of the Sherrys. Kirksey Nix and LaRae Sharp were indicted on 52 counts, including fraud, money laundering, and murder. Halat was tried and convicted in the summer of 1997, a full decade after the crimes were committed. He was sentenced to 18 years in federal prison. Also tried and convicted were Kirksey Nix and Thomas Holcomb, the hitman. Both were sentenced to life. Larray Sharp, Nix's girlfriend, got five years. I think a lot of citizens in Biloxi now realize that there are a lot of dedicated professional law enforcement people who will do everything they can to uh, protect the community and work hard to solve major crimes. Uh, perhaps the uh, legacy, you might say, of the case for the criminal element is that they realize after seeing this case that they can commit a crime one day and think they're getting away with it a year later, but it could come back uh, 10 years later and get them. While the Sherry's killers were finally brought to justice, Margaret Sherry's dream of a Biloxi free of gambling was never realized. Instead, Biloxi has become a resort town filled with casinos and neon lights. The sleepy southern town is gone forever, along with the woman who lost her life trying to save it.
10 days before the holidays in a small Pennsylvania town. A new mother is excited by her baby's first Christmas. But when they disappear without a trace, the holiday turns tragic. Investigators suspect her husband is somehow responsible. But with little evidence, they called on the FBI to find the answers before time ran out for the missing mother and child. The woman and her infant son vanish. The husband is frantic. The clues are scarce. But hopes linger, even as the hours and days tick by without a word. Was she on the run or the victim of foul play? I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. It was an investigation filled with blind alleys and dead ends. In order to go forward, we had to revisit the past. Catasauqua, Pennsylvania, one hour north of Philadelphia, a quiet blue-collar town, a safe place to raise a family. By December 15, 1994, the town was preparing for the holiday season. The house at 740 Front Street was already decorated. Inside, 26-year-old Joanne Katrinak, happily married and a new mother, was especially excited about the holidays. It would be the first Christmas for her four-month-old son, Alex. Joanne and her mother-in-law, Veronica, planned to spend the day at a nearby mall. Now Joanne called to say that Alex was dressed and ready. They'd be right over. Joanne wanted to find the perfect gift for her husband, Andy. They'd been married less than two years. And though they didn't have a lot of money, Joanne had been saving for the holiday. Before Joanne had met Andy, she had had some bad relationships. Her first husband was abusive. The marriage had ended in divorce. But she was happy now. Her husband, Andy Ketrin, came home a little after six o'clock that evening. He was self-employed as a contractor and sometimes worked long hours. Before he'd met Joanne, Andy had been a confirmed bachelor. But it seemed that finding this kind and beautiful woman had changed his life. Usually, Joanne and Alex were waiting for him when he came home but not tonight. That didn't seem to worry Andy. After all, it was Christmas time and the mall traffic would be heavy. He saw that Joanne had left some chicken to defrost. He settled in to relax and wait for his family. An hour went by. Than another. Still, Andy didn't seem concerned. He watched TV and drank another beer. At 8 p.m., Andy finally decided to check on his wife.
His first call was to his mother, Veronica. Hi, Mom. You seen Joanne? He knew Joanne had planned to shop with her. Well, it's, uh... But now his mother now. said Joanne had never come by. No, 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 I... Well, did you... you had Nor had she up? answered her phone calls. Well, no, no, she didn't. That's why I'm calling you, because I haven't seen her. I hadn't heard from her yet. No. Well, what'd you guys do? Veronica was worried. She said she right, and her husband, bye. Andrew Sr., would be right over. While he waited for his parents, Andy checked the house to see if anything was amiss. In the basement, he found the door leading outside, open. A door he and Joanne never used. The lock had been pried away from the door frame. Andy immediately called the police. Two officers from the Catasauqua Police Department responded. By then, Andy's parents had arrived. Andy told police the events of the day. The shopping trip that never happened. The apparent disappearance of Joanne and little Alex. He claimed they had been abducted. And officers agreed that was a possibility. But it was also oh, plausible that Joanne had left on her own and taken her child with her. Well, uh, yeah, I, I or maybe Andy had somehow been involved. Veronica described her phone call with Joanne and the subsequent calls that went unanswered. I had my coat on and waited, and she never showed up. Here, you guys see this? Andy now showed police the padlock that had been broken off the basement door. But the officers were not convinced it was related to the missing mother and child. That night, Andy stayed home by the phone while his father searched the surrounding area for Joanne and Alex. At three in the morning, Andrew Sr. had found something and brought his son to see it. This. Joanne's tan Toyota was backed into a spot in the parking lot of McCarty's Tavern. What is this? Down the street from the Katrinax home. That's oh, a keys, Andy. Inside yeah, were Joanne's there? keys and her small canister of mace. Again, Andy called Catasauqua police. This time, police suspected foul play. But the local force lacked the resources and experience needed to lead the investigation. So they contacted Pennsylvania state troopers for assistance. With the possibility of an abduction, Major Robert Wirtz looked to the most likely suspect, Joanne's husband, Andy Katrinak. There was a lot of looking into the family life and looking at what Andrew did on that particular day and, uh, and those sorts of things. Uh, you know, one of the things that you're always forced to do in these uh, types of investigations is look at family members. State police arrived at Andy's house the next morning. You see that right there? Andy told them that overnight he had noticed something else, a cut phone line in the basement. Is a crime scene down here? One of two separate phone lines in the house. And I left it. The one cut serviced the cordless phone while the other serviced the kitchen phone. It appeared to investigators that whoever cut the line knew where to look and which one to cut. State police evidence technicians also found a partial boot print on the basement floor and tool marks on the door frame where the padlock was pried off. As crime scene technicians checked the house, they found nothing to remove suspicion from Andy. In the master bedroom, there was no indication Joanne had packed for a long trip. Andy confirmed that his wife's clothes all seemed to be in the closet, and the couple's suitcases were under the bed where he said they always kept them. Technicians found no blood or other signs of foul play. They dusted for fingerprints around the room's entry points, but found only Andy's and Joanne's. In the baby's room, 
There were also no signs that little Alex had been taken on a long trip and no indication of a struggle or robbery. At the state police barracks garage, evidence technicians processed Joanne's car. They hoped something left behind could lead them closer to the missing mother and child. On the headrest of the driver's seat, they found six dirty blonde hairs. One was partially smeared with a dark red substance, maybe blood. But nothing immediately pointed to Joanne and Alex's whereabouts. As lead investigator, Trooper Bob Egan was suspicious of the way the car had been found. There were a couple things that led Andy Katrinak to believe that his wife did not back that car. And number one is that she never used that parking lot uh, to park her vehicle. They had a parking lot in back of their house. And number two, she never backed the car in. Uh, when she parked into a parking space, she always pulled in front of the vehicle first. Uh, she was very bad at backing up. Three days had passed since Andy's wife and son disappeared. His parents posted flyers throughout his neighborhood and in Katasakwa's shopping district. Tell me, have you seen this woman the baby? Anywhere Joanne and Alex no, might have sorry, visited. I have not. Oh, this is a picture of our daughter-in-law. This is our grandchild. With still no word from Joanne or a kidnapper, troopers delved further into Andy's background. They found him anxious when he spoke of his former days as a semi-pro boxer in Las Vegas. He was good with his fists and earned his living as an instructor when he first moved to Pennsylvania. Now a private contractor, Andy barely made enough to pay the bills. A wife, a house, and a baby strained the new father's resources. Troopers asked to see his financial records, including insurance documents, bank statements, and phone records. I got some checks. I he to told them that his wife had only minimal life insurance. I know you wanted, probably would have wanted phone records. I brought that down too. On the day she disappeared with his son, Andy said he had been with his father, building a room addition for a client who lived a few miles from his home. Troopers were not satisfied. They suspected he may have still been hiding something. They demanded that Andy take no. a polygraph test. Right now, do you know where your wife is located? No, I don't. The first test showed that Andy had not been deceptive regarding his family's disappearance. But investigators needed to be sure. So they tested him again. No, I didn't. The results were conclusive. No. Andy was telling the truth about his missing wife and baby. Investigators cleared the husband as a suspect. No, I'm not. By now, Joanne and Alex had been missing for four days, and investigators still had no solid leads. Whether it had been a desertion or an abduction, it was possible the woman and child had crossed state lines. On December 19, 1994, state police called on the FBI for help. Special Agent Dave Rowe from the FBI's Allentown office joined the effort. We began our investigation uh, by identifying, locating, and interviewing virtually all of the relatives, uh, virtually all of the friends, former work colleagues, uh, anybody and everybody uh, who was either related to or acquainted with uh, Andy, Joanne, and uh, Alex. Hands open. Coffee? Yes, thank you. Local, state, and federal agencies funneled their resources into the search for the missing woman and child. Six days before Christmas, it seemed as if they had vanished without a trace. Joanne Katrinak, a 26-year-old mother, and her four-month-old son, Alex, had mysteriously disappeared from their Catasauqua, Pennsylvania home. Her husband, Andy, had been cleared of suspicion. 
Now investigators traveled across Pennsylvania state lines to question Joanne's ex-husband, who lived and worked in New Jersey. Mike Jack had married Joanne in 1991. They were divorced just a few months later, amidst allegations that Jack was abusive. Maybe Joanne had decided to rekindle the relationship. Or perhaps her ex had come to win her back. But investigators found Jack had a solid alibi for the date of Joanne's disappearance. Agents also pursued people from Andy's past. What are you doing here? Well, including his ex-girlfriend, Pat Rohrer. December 14th. Anything wrong? An FBI no, agent interviewed what, Rohrer um, at her home in North Carolina. Oh, sure. Yeah, I keep yeah. He found she, too, had a solid alibi for the day Joanne and Alex had vanished. I'll tell you what, I'd really appreciate that, man. Okay. Back in Catasauqua, investigators returned to McCarty's Tavern, where Joanne's car had been found the day she had disappeared. Maybe someone had noticed her, or whoever had parked the car. Troopers and agents eventually interviewed everyone who had been at the bar that night. But no one had seen a thing. Were you working last Thursday night? Yes, I was. Investigators also canvassed the Katrinak neighborhood. One neighbor directed them to a handyman who rented a room down the street. He'd done repair work in several local homes. Detectives soon discovered he had a criminal record for breaking and entering. He seemed a promising suspect. He admitted to police he had had some run-ins with the law, but swore he had no knowledge of Joanne and Alex's disappearance. He agreed to come in for further questioning. Investigators learned the handyman lived in a lean-to by a river near the Katrinak's house during the summer months. The state police canine team searched the shelter for any evidence that Joanne and Alex had been there. They found nothing and the handyman was cleared. Another dead end. For frustrated investigators, precious time slipped away as community concern grew. Come in. State Police Major Robert Wirtz helped establish hotlines to elicit the public's help. There was uh, obviously a lot of concerns in, in, the, uh, in the community as to what occurred. So we had a command post set up here at the barracks with a number of telephone lines coming into the command post. Those phone numbers were given to the public. And we, in fact, did get information from the public. Reports of sightings poured in. One resident reported seeing Joanne with an unidentified man near railroad now. tracks behind the Katrinak's home. She was carrying a baby and seemed frightened by the man pulling her further into the brush against her will. In response, FBI agents and state police immediately conducted a massive line search of a four-mile stretch near the railroad tracks. The search continued through the night. They scanned the area inch by inch as choppers circled overhead. But again, investigators found nothing. Trooper Joe Kosovar now co-lead investigator with his partner, Bob Egan, recalls that reports of sightings continued. They saw her along the railroad tracks. They saw her on an airplane. They saw her in a convenience store with the baby. But none of them checked out. Uh, they were false leads, and apparently people uh, who they saw and thought they saw were two different people. Christmas passed and spring began with still no word of Joanne and Alex. Then on April 9th, a farmer was tilling his field in Heidelberg Township, 15 miles northwest of Catasauqua. 
he saw what looked like a pile of clothes at the field's edge. When he walked over to investigate, he encountered a horrifying sight. Human remains. Four months after the disappearance of Joanne Katrinak and her infant son, Alex, a farmer found the decaying bodies of a mother and child at the edge of his Pennsylvania field. The FBI and troopers arrived immediately. Dental records would later confirm what they already suspected. The bodies were Alex and Joanne Katrinak's. Joanne lay on her back, a diaper bag still on her shoulder. She had been shot once in the head and beaten about the face. Alex was face down on his mother's stomach, dressed in the blue snowsuit he'd worn on his ill-fated trip to meet his grandmother. The bodies were 50 feet past the end of a trail that ran through the woods. Nearby, crime scene technicians found a baby bottle and a rattle. To trooper Bob Egan, the location of the items was significant. You could see items that had, had fallen to the ground almost in a sequence as, as, as if uh, an assault started and Joanne was walking or running away from the assault and she was dropping items along the way. It appeared the killer had driven up to the end of the trail and from there had forced Joanne to walk the remaining 50 feet. Evidence technicians would spend 15 hours searching the area, but they found no shell casings, fingerprints, footprints, or murder weapons. In the hopes that the forest debris might yield answers, they collected leaves and dirt from beneath the bodies and sent them to the police lab for closer examination. For Major Robert Wirtz and the others who worked the case for months, the finality of this brutal murder evoked a barrage of emotions. When the bodies were found, there was a period of time there when it was uh, very difficult for the, uh, for the officers that were assigned to this investigation took it very personally, uh, and it, it was hard, because I think they were holding out hope that, you know, she was going to be found alive. With the mysterious disappearance officially deemed a homicide, the case remained under state jurisdiction. But the FBI never stopped actively assisting. Hello, Linda. Dave Rowe here. The fact that somebody would abduct a new mother and a four-month-old infant. Everybody can identify with that. And once you become aware of that, you want to be part of the investigation. An autopsy revealed that Joanne had been shot once with a 22 caliber bullet and beaten 19 times with a blunt object. The fact that there had been two modes of attack was a telling clue for Trooper Joe Kosovar. Based on the absence of empty shell casings and the fact that the victim had received one shot and numerous blows to the head led me to believe that the gun malfunctioned. The medical examiner was unable to determine exactly how baby Alex was killed, whether he'd been suffocated or left to die of exposure. Police continued to analyze the physical evidence found at the crime scene. To help build the case, they brought in prosecutor Mike McIntyre of the Lehigh County District Attorney's Office. We found two more hairs that first match the six hairs found on that headrest in color and length. But the hairs would have to be examined forensically to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they matched. A Pennsylvania State Police forensic scientist conducted the lab analysis. The results confirmed what investigators had suspected. The hairs belonged to the same person. And the substance on one of them was determined to be human blood, containing DNA consistent with Joanne's. 
But to whom did the hares belong? Tests quickly ruled out the Katrinax and several of Joanne's friends who had access to the car. Pennsylvania State Police were baffled. Bob, how far are we on? Again, they turned to the FBI for help. The FBI sent a behavioral profiler from Washington, D.C. A profiler can help narrow the search for suspects by detailing the type of person responsible for a crime through that person's behavioral characteristics. Profilers study a variety of crime-related information, including case reports, geography, timing, and the victim's habits. Then they revisit the crime scenes to read the locations for clues to the killer's behavior. Investigators first took the profiler to the place the bodies were found. He would look for anything that might reveal the killer's signature. The area was so far from the abduction site, the profiler was convinced the killer had been here before. The profiler also hypothesized the killer had been male because the attack had been so brutal. The abduction had taken place in broad daylight, which offered another hint. The killer would be someone comfortable being seen in the small town of Katasakwa, and someone who perhaps knew the family's habits and the layout of the house. By fleshing out this portrait of the killer, the profiler gave investigators new direction in a frustrating case. But troopers needed a name that fit the profile. To find that name, troopers drove Andy around Heidelberg Township, close to where the bodies were found. They hoped to prompt his memory of someone who knew this rural area. They asked if Joanne had ever visited here. Was there a friend or a family member who lived nearby? And he could think of no one. Disappointed, investigators returned to state police headquarters. Then, just as Andy was about to leave, he remembered something. He did know someone who knew Heidelberg Township and also his home in Katasaka. His ex girlfriend, Pat Rohrer, had once managed a stable in Heidelberg. And with that, he tells me that he couldn't tell me the exact place, but, uh, what it was called, because he couldn't remember the name, but he could give me directions on how to get there. So I told him, I said, well, tell me. As he started to tell me the directions of how to get to where Patty Roar was boarding a horse and taking care of horses, well, I knew he was taking me right to the area where Joanne and the baby were found. We used to go together. Pat Rohrer and Andy had lived together briefly in Pennsylvania. He told investigators he once visited her at the stable. But they'd broken up in 1989, and she had moved back to North Carolina. It's all right. Then in the spring of 1991, before Andy met Joanne, Rohrer had visited him unexpectedly after a fight with her most recent boyfriend. And he was sympathetic. He let Rora stay for a few days, though their relationship remained purely a friendship. So tell me about then she returned to North Carolina. Uh, President Road. Not long after that, Andy met Joanne. We lived together for a while. As he now told state troopers, it was love at first bad. sight. You know. They were married <laughs> soon after, in the spring of 1993. <laughs> they agreed they wanted children, and less than a year later, Joanne was pregnant. Hey, sweetie. Hi, baby. Alex was Alex born in August of 1994. Oh, yeah. That you think is so adorable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and I think it's... Um, now Andy it's, told investigators me. about something that had happened three days before his wife and son disappeared. I will. Hello? On December 12th, Joanne answered a phone call. Hey, Thomas calling. 
It was Pat Rohr. Pat. What does she want? What do you think she wants? Joanne told Rora that Andy was married now and that they had a baby. She told Rora not to call again. Please, don't then call Then Joanne us. hung up on her. Though Andy knew Pat had a temper, he dismissed the idea that she might seek revenge. Then the investigation took an unexpected turn. The second mother and child were found brutally murdered. The pair, who resembled Joanne and Alex, were discovered in a retail store dressing room in nearby Collegeville, Pennsylvania. Investigators now wondered if a serial killer was on the loose, preying on mothers and children in Pennsylvania. While investigating the homicide of Joanne and Alex Katrinak, Pennsylvania State Police responded to another double murder in a retail store just 45 miles away. The victims were a second young mother and her baby. Police feared a serial killer was on the prowl. They quickly arrested the suspect, the store owner's son. While he confessed to this killing, he had an airtight alibi for the day Joanne and Alex were slain. Now police turned their attention to Andy Katrinak's ex-girlfriend, Pat Rohrer. Yeah, we got a couple things to run down. Rohrer was a long shot, a brunette instead of a blonde, and a woman, though the profiler believed the murderer was male. But she was familiar with both the abduction and murder sites. Then Trooper Joe Kosovar recalled that he'd worked on a case that was strangely similar. He phoned Special Agent Dave Rowe. Trooper Joe Kosovar recollected that he had investigated a homicide some years earlier where the cause of death was blunt force blows to the head. The assailant was determined to be a woman, while one, two, three, four blows by an adult male uh, would produce the same damage that a woman might have to strike 15, 20, 25 blows to accomplish. Joanne Katrinak had sustained 19 blows. But could a woman have killed her and her infant as well? In May of 1995, six months after the murders, troopers Bob Egan and Joe Kosovar traveled to North Carolina. The FBI had helped coordinate a meeting with the Lexington County Sheriff's Office. Together, authorities from the two states would interview Pat Rohrer at her attorney's office. Rohrer's mother was also there. Can you exercise the horses? Can you tell us more? Rohrer expanded upon her original alibis. On December 15th, the day of the crime, she said she'd visited a local tanning salon. That evening, she'd taken her regular Thursday night dance lesson at the Cowboys Nightlife Bar. Rohrer admitted she'd worked at the stable in Heidelberg Township, but said she hadn't been back to Pennsylvania since she'd visited Andy after the fight with her boyfriend. She also swore she'd never owned a gun. Lieutenant Tony Roberson of the Lexington County Sheriff's Department helped agents and troopers investigate her statements. The first thing that they wanted to do was uh, discredit her alibis to find out whether they could be corroborated, whether they could be found to be invalid. Excuse me, ma'am. Investigators Hi. visited the tanning salon Rora claimed to have used on the day of the murders. Prosecutor Mike McIntyre remembers this alibi quickly proved false. The owner of the tanning salon, Mrs. Simerson, said, hey, you know what? Something's wrong here because we were closed on that particular day that Pat Rohr says she was in getting a tan because that's my husband's birthday and we were over at the shopping mart in some city about 50 miles away and I remember that and I hear I have a receipt from for you from the shopping mall to show that we were there. Excuse me, sir. 
at the Cowboys nightlife bar. The dance instructor knew Rohrer as a regular. We're investigating a murder up in Pennsylvania, and we understand that... Uh, the club's sign-in sheet showed she'd been there the Thursday before December 15th and the Thursday after, but not on the 15th. Investigators secured Rohrer's phone records. They showed she'd used the phone every day of December 1994, except from the 12th through the 15th. Despite her alibis, Rora could not prove she'd been in North Carolina on the day of the killings. More incriminating still, her police record revealed a history of violence. She has violent tendencies, has had them in the past. She was charged in a neighboring county in Forsyth County of getting into a fight over a man at a bar, and uh, she was arrested that night. But investigators were still missing one key piece of evidence, the murder weapon. Rora continued to deny she'd ever owned a gun, but investigators kept digging. At a North Carolina stable, they found one of her ex-boyfriends, Walter Blaylock. He distinctly remembered that Rora had bought a handgun for $50 at a yard sale. One time. It was a 22 caliber Jennings, which they had used for target shooting in Rohrer's backyard. You put your hands on me, girl. The last time he had seen it was during an intense argument. Now Blaylock told Trooper Egan the gun had a curious flaw. He went on to describe the handgun as uh, being a junky piece of junk type of handgun that often after the first time you shot it, it jammed, uh, not allowing you to fire a second shot. Now this fed into the theory why somebody would be shot once and then beaten about the head. The FBI helped coordinate interstate efforts to secure a probable cause warrant to search Rohrer's North Carolina home for the murder weapon. They arrived with the warrant on July 24th, 1995. Despite a thorough search, they didn't find the gun. But they did find numerous spent 22 caliber shell casings in the backyard. Only when police told Rora that they knew she owned a handgun did she admit to it. But she insisted Blaylock had taken it with him when he'd moved out about a month before the murders. No, no, I have not. Why did you buy the gun? I told you. The case against Rora was growing, but it was built on circumstantial evidence. Just because he wanted this gun. And strangely, the only physical evidence, the hairs from the car and the murder site, didn't seem to fit. The hairs were dirty blonde. Rora's hair was brown. Trooper Joe Kosovar wondered if it could have been dyed at the time of the killings. He learned that shortly before the murders, Rohrer had ridden in a rodeo competition and won. Kosovar contacted the event organizers, hoping they'd taken a photo of her. His inquiry paid off. They sent him the photo. As he'd guessed, Rohrer's hair was dirty blonde. The photograph was uh, given to our crime lab personnel, and they compared the color of the photograph of the hair with the color of the hairs that were found in the vehicle and decided that they should further investigate those hairs. Detectives obtained a warrant to collect blood and hair samples from Pat Rohrer. If evidence analysts could match her hair to those from Joanne's car on the murder site, the troopers could make their arrest. But they would need to rely on a test so new that it would take more than a year for the test to be approved. Until then, the prime suspect of the double murder would remain free. After an investigation that had lasted almost a year, Detectives had a strong suspect in the double murder of Joanne Katrinak and her infant son, Alex. 
With a search warrant, they obtained blood and hair samples from Pat Rohrer, the former girlfriend of Joanne's husband, Andy. Rohrer was now pregnant with the child of her current boyfriend. Forensic scientists would attempt to match her hair samples with hair found at the crime scenes. The Pennsylvania State Police Lab determined Rohrer's hairs were microscopically consistent with the recovered hairs. But investigators needed more proof, a match at the cellular level. They extracted Rohrer's DNA sequence from her blood samples and attempted to compare it with the DNA and hairs from the crime scenes. But there was a problem making a match. Joseph DeZino, unit chief of the DNA Analysis Unit 2 at the FBI lab, explains. When hairs are found at a crime scene, they're normally naturally shed hairs that don't have much tissue upon their root. And if they don't have much tissue upon the root, there's very, very little DNA contained in those hairs. And therefore, our experience has shown us that nuclear DNA analysis will fail. In this case, only one of the hairs found at the crime scene contained enough skin tissue necessary for nuclear DNA analysis. But there was a great risk. To conduct the test, examiners would have to destroy that sample. If the test was inconclusive, there was no way to repeat the process. They needed a way to test the other hairs that held no skin tissue. A possible solution lay in a new process being pioneered by the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. Mitochondrial DNA testing. This was brand new. To my knowledge, this was the first forensics laboratory in the United States to bring this new analysis online. Because the test was so new, it would take more than a year to be certain the results could be scientifically reliable. Mitochondrial DNA testing uses the DNA contained in the cell's mitochondria, or organelles. Since there is more mitochondrial DNA than nuclear DNA in hair cells, it is easier for examiners to retrieve the mitochondrial DNA. With five hair samples to test, examiners could repeat the test and obtain more reliable results. With mitochondrial DNA analysis, we're over 90% successful obtaining DNA from hairs that are naturally shed, hairs without root, and we're, we only need about one inch of hair in order to obtain a result, generally speaking. To attempt a mitochondrial DNA match, first the DNA sequence in a hair cell's mitochondria is isolated. Then its sequence is plotted and compared to the suspect's known DNA sequence, in this case taken from Pat Rohrer's blood cells. Both DNA sequences matched. Forensic scientist Joseph DeZeno explains what that meant. If a hair from a crime scene is found to have the same mitochondrial DNA type as a blood sample from a suspect, our reports state that that suspect cannot be excluded as a source of that hair from the crime scene. Therefore, Patricia Rohr could not be excluded as a source of these hairs. However, without nuclear DNA confirmation, the result was not absolutely conclusive. Now scientists examined the hair sample with skin for a nuclear DNA match. It corroborated the mitochondrial match. There was no question that Patricia Rohrer had left those hairs behind. It was a pivotal moment in the case. In the early morning of June 24, 1997, investigators arrived at Rohrer's home with an arrest warrant. Pat Rohrer? I've got a warrant for your arrest. I need you to come with us, ma'am, please. Yes. Deputy, go with him. A female detective followed Rohrer upstairs to keep an eye on her as she dressed herself and her 18-month-old daughter. It seemed a routine safety precaution but it yielded some of the most damaging evidence in the case. 
During the time that Pat was trying to settle her baby down and get dressed, the female detective, Suzanne Pearson, was present in the bedroom. And it was at this time that she overheard a conversation that Pat Rohrer had with her baby. Uh, Pat's baby's name is Nicole. And what the detective overheard was Pat Rohrer saying to Nicole, uh, Nicole, if I would have known I was going to get caught, I would have never brought you into this world. Uh, it was something that Suzanne Pearson, the detective, documented uh, as soon as possible. And this was very damaging. More than three years after the murder of Joanne Katrinak and her baby, Pat Rohrer was finally under arrest. She was flown to Pennsylvania to face murder charges. Preparing for trial, prosecutors pieced together the terrifying events of Joanne and Alex Katrinak's last day. On December 15, 1994, Pat Rohr had broken into the basement of the Katrinak's home, knowing Andy was out and Joanne was alone with Alex. Yeah. Joanne had no idea Rohr was downstairs as she called her okay. mother-in-law and packed up baby Alex okay. for a shopping trip. Right. From the basement, Rohr heard every word Joanne said. All right, I'll see you in a bit. And she remembered the house from a visit with Andy three years earlier. She knew where to look for the two phone lines and which one to cut so Joanne couldn't call for help. Joanne carried Alex outside, still unaware that Pat was in the house. Rora heard Joanne leave and went outside to catch up with her. Joanne didn't see Rohrer sneak up behind her, carrying a 22 caliber Jennings. Oh, get, get in the car. Oh my God. Get in the car. Rohrer jumped into the back seat with the baby and forced Joanne to drive. Joanne must have been terrified as she drove with Laura's gun at her head, afraid for herself, and more so for her helpless four-month-old baby. Laura directed Joanne to an obscure horse trail in Heidelberg Township. forced her further into the woods. Joanne, in her terror, dropped Alex's rattle and then his bottle. Rora fired once, but then her gun jammed, and she began bludgeoning Joanne. She may have suffocated baby Alex, or simply left him to die slowly of exposure to the December elements. Then Rora parked the car at McCarty's Tavern and fled from Pennsylvania. Prosecutors built an airtight case, using evidence investigators had meticulously collected. It was a concerted effort by many in law Paragraph enforcement, unwilling to let this woman and child perish in silence. As investigators, we have a responsibility, and that responsibility is to be the voice of the victim, is to gather the information and uh, speak for the victims that can no longer speak. Close six. The jury found Pat Rora guilty of two counts of kidnapping and two of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. Legally, the case was closed, and for the town of Katasakwa, the mystery was solved.
if not for the advanced forensic technology of the FBI, this brutal double murderer might still be free.